So this morning we're going to preach to you on a message entitled, Only One Came Back. Amen. Only One Came Back. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. And as he went to Jerusalem, it happened that he went through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, ten leprous men met him who stood afar off. And they lifted uh, up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, pity us. And seeing them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And it happened as they went that they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and glorified God with a loud voice. And he fell down on his face at his feet, thanking him, and, and, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the other nine? Were none found who were none found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has cured you. Now, if I had the time this morning, and it would probably take me two services to be able to do this, I would talk to you about three different words. That, that we should notice, and we should take notice. This might be something for you to do a Bible study on in this particular verse. In the 14th verse, he says at the end of that verse, and it happened as they went, they were cleansed. Everyone say cleansed. Okay, that's one word, all right? But notice in the 15th verse, in the first part of it, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, different word, different word, all right? There's cleansed, there's heal. Now I want you to notice in the 19th verse. And he said to him, rise and go, your faith has cured you. These are three different words, very distinct words. Okay, This is something that I would challenge you. Go and find out what he's talking about. These are, these are three different things that are transpiring and taking place. But that's not the title of the message. This is something, though, that we need to realize Listen, folks, God desires to bless you. Do you know that? Amen? You know that? He wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. He really does. But I want you to understand here today that though he reigns on the just and the unjust alike, and though he blesses even the sinner, and how many knows that he does that too? Amen. We know that God's blessings are not just reserved for the children of God. Amen. We, have you ever met somebody that was a heathen, but they were blessed? Yeah. Seemed like everything they touched was blessed. Everything they did was blessed. How is that possible? Who knows? Maybe it was a praying mother, a praying father. Amen? Maybe it was a praying grandparent. We don't know. We don't know the covering that was put over them. But imagine what they could do if their heart was right with the Lord. Imagine how they could impact the kingdom of God and this world for the kingdom of God if they were walking in unity of spirit between them and God. Imagine what they could do. Imagine the anointing that could flow from a person like that that seems to be blessed in every direction of their life. See, that's my mother. That's been my father. My mother and my father, though they have not always had, you know, they've never lived in a mansion. We weren't raised in a mansion. In fact, that was one of the things we were talking about. I remember going back to my house, and I was raised here for 17 years, and, and I want to buy that house. I want that to be my retirement house. But them sorry people won't move out. No matter what I tell them, they, they won't move out. But when I went and I looked at the house, you know, when I was growing up, it was a, it was a big house, I thought. I thought it was, man, this was, this was like, we had everything, man. I remember when we got a swamp cooler. Woo! If you lived in Tri-Cities, you'd have understood back in the day, man, a swamp cooler was better than nothing. I can assure you. And when we got that swamp cooler, man, I thought, wow, I thought we had arrived, you know, until I went to the neighbor's house and they had a full-blown air conditioner. I was like, wow, we're poor. <laughs> um, then I remember when we got our air conditioner, and man, I really thought we had arrived. I, you know, I, I mean, I remember that we were grateful for the small things, amen? We were grateful for those things when it was 115 degrees. Believe me, I was thrilled to death to go sit in that living room when the swamp cooler was gone. Amen. It was, it was an awesome thing to experience. But now that I go to that house and I drive up to that house, it's a little tiny house. It, it's not big at all. I mean, it, it's a... It's a really small house. 
And, and I'm assuming it still has the basement in it, but I remember as a kid thinking, man, we lived in a really big, huge house. Until I see it now, and it's probably smaller than this, and I'm sure it's probably smaller than this room. But I was so grateful and felt like we were so blessed to be people that had such a nice home with property that we could have a farm, you know, and we could raise animals and do all those things. I thought we were the upper class people. We were poor like some of the people I knew. Amen. Amen. Now I look back and think, we were poor like everybody I knew. <laughs> Amen. But I was so I was grateful, and I'm so grateful that I was raised in that atmosphere and raised. I remember living that. Now I tell you what, you want to talk about being grateful for small things. I remember as a kid <coughs> when the mosquito truck would come by. Anybody know what a mosquito truck is? You ever live around those areas where the mosquito truck came? And, and they would drive down the road, and this and it was a mass fog that was behind them, and they would they would be spraying for mosquitoes. And we used to get on our bicycles. And Sister Stephanie, we would ride in the fog. Can't even imagine what that did to us, you know? But we used to ride in that fog, man. We used to chase the mosquito truck. Boy, I'm telling you, we were uptown folks. We weren't from the other side of the tracks like some of them was. We was the uptown folks. We had a mosquito truck that came through our neighborhood. Woo! I'm telling you. Humble upbringings. But very grateful that I had what I had. Because honestly, I knew people that didn't have anything close to what we had. Amen. Amen. I knew those people that, that they got borrowed shoes, and those borrowed shoes was all they had all year long. And those shoes, if they survived the year, they got passed to a sibling. Anybody you, you relate with what I'm saying? I'm so grateful today for the many blessings that God has afforded me. And when we read this story, we can't help but can't help but reflect. I don't know about you, but I can't help but reflect and say, how often have I gone back to the Lord and thanked Him for all that He has done? Uh, sometimes I think that's something that we forget to do because we get caught up in life. Amen? There are many things this morning that we can and should be thankful for. Let me give you a quick list um, of things that we should be thankful for. Before we get into the heart of the message, let me just share some things that we should be thankful for. How about for automatic dishwashers? Yeah. Oh, ladies, y'all should have just shouted, running aisles, jumping pews, swinging from the chandeliers at that moment right there. Think about this. They make it possible to get out of the kitchen before the big game starts on Sunday afternoons. Woo! Even the guys can help get it done so we don't have to worry about that clanking and all you guys messing around when we're trying to watch a game. Nah, I'm just kidding. How about for husbands who attack small repair jobs around the house? Are you thankful for that? Or how about for wives who have such confidence in those husbands as they knock out walls with the intentions of remodeling an entire kitchen in five days before he returns from a trip overseas? Sorry, I digress. <laughs> if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, come on over to my house. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The overseer, he posted on Facebook yesterday his beautiful Christmas tree that they put up. And so I responded, I would love to put my Christmas tree up, but I don't have a living room. I don't have a dining room, and I don't have a kitchen. I'm sorry, it's personal. Um, I do have those things. They're just under major construction right now. But she's thankful for a husband that is willing to try that. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'm willing. I'm, I'm thankful for a church that continues to pray for their pastor to finish that construction. Um, number three. How about for a bathtub? Who's thankful for a bathtub? I, I saw Kitty's husband look over at Kim building just like, well. <laughs> Amen. Think about this. It's the one place a person can escape from the rigors of life, family, and responsibilities. Amen? I have a cousin that every once in a while, she posts on there, it's bath time. And then, she's, and, 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 and then she usually has something after it that says, I'm sick of life, I'm sick of people, I'm sick of my children and my husband, I'm taking a bath. It's a time to escape. 
Amen. It's a time to escape. How about for children? You're thankful for children who put away their things and clean up after themselves. Think about that. They're such a joy to have, and you really hate it when they have to go home to their own parents. Okay, you didn't get it. I'm, I'll say it again. We're, I'll say it real slow, okay? We're thankful for the children. Who, who, how many have children who put their stuff away? Okay, none of us. Okay, we pick up after them. Oh, I have a 22-year-old, 23-year-old that lives in my house. I still pick up after him. And, 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 but think about it. These children, they're such a joy to have, and you really hate it when they have to leave your house and go to their own house. You know? In other words, number five, how about for teenagers? How many thankful for teenagers? Okay. <laughs> Some of you don't have teenagers. Those that have teenagers are like, yeah, well. And, and, and I thought this was kind of cute. This is why I put it in here. We're thankful for teenagers because it gives parents the opportunity to learn a second language. <laughs> right? <laughs> Amen. How about for smoke alarms? Are you thankful for smoke alarms? Because they let you know when the turkey's done. <laughs> How about for pastors? Are you thankful for pastors who recognize the need to cut down on the number of in-closings? During the holidays, so we can be excused for the potluck dinners that await our attention. <laughs> Amen. So we'll try only to give you one in closing today. How about are you thankful for the worship team who recognizes the same thing as the pastor? <laughs> All right. How about for hair? Are you thankful? Sorry, bro. Um, are you thankful for hair, whether it grows on your hair or on your head? Your face, your legs, your arms, your back, your armpits. Hair is a good thing. It warms us. It helps identify us. It allows us to express our creativity or fashion style. It also keeps us humble when it starts falling out. <laughs> Amen. And finally, here's one to be thankful for, cat videos. Amen? Come on. You all know when you get on Facebook, you see the cat videos you sit and watch them. Okay. That's just a fun list. There's like a million of them online. You can go and be thankful for lots of other things. Psalms chapter 107, verse 8 says, All that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the sons of man. This morning we want to share with you this thought because I think it's very important. We need to understand the necessity of being thankful. We need to understand that everything that we have is only because of God. If it wasn't for Him, we would have nothing. We would have nothing. And the greatest thing that we could ever hope for is to find favor in His eyes. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. One of God's faithful missionaries, Alan uh, Gardner, experienced many physical difficulties and hardships throughout his service to the Savior. Despite his troubles, he said, while God gives me strength, failure will not daunt me. In 1851, at the age of 57, he died of disease and starvation while serving on Pitcombe Island in the southern tip of South America. When his body was found, his diary lay nearby. It bore the record of hunger, thirst, wounds, and loneliness. The last entry in his little book showed the struggle of his shaking hand as he tried to write legibly. It read, I am overwhelmed with a sense of goodness of the I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. Yet he died of starvation and disease. He had nothing, he was lonely, he was thirsty, he was hungry, yet he says he's overwhelmed with the goodness of God. Think of that. No word of complaint, no childish whining, no grumbling at the circumstances, just praise for God's goodness. When we think of stories like this, it stirs within us a sense of humility and often embarrassment. When preparing for today's sermon, I couldn't help but feel a sense of embarrassment and perhaps grief when I considered how many times I brought displeasure to the Lord through the years by my childish whining. Of course, I'm the only one in the building that has ever done that, right? We whine about our circumstances. 
We whine about our circumstances. We whine about our circumstances. Right? We're, we're, we, we constantly are saying, if only, or I wish it could have, and why not? And, and these things are usually the things that come out of our mouth, rather than, I'm very thankful that God is still on the throne. I'm thankful for what He's doing in my life. I'm thankful that whatever I have or whatever, whatever I don't have, He sees fit to give me what is necessary. Oftentimes, we as people, blessed by God, struggle to find the capacity to humble ourselves and to show gratitude for all the many blessings the Lord has provided us. All too often, our minds only reflect this way, in part, by the holidays or by tragedy or events that stirs within us a sense of thanksgiving that we are not directly affected. I don't know about you, but I don't know how this has been affecting you watching the things that are going on on um, TV and the things that are going on around the world. I don't know if some of you put two and two together, but the, but the new ISIS um, uh, group that they have found, um, it came out of the very neighborhood that I was in in Brussels just a couple weeks ago. That group that had went over to Paris, it came right out of the neighborhood where we were at the church there, uh, where the church is running 3,000 people. It's in a Muslim neighborhood there, and, and yet it's a bright and shining light. And my prayer, and I sent a, a message to Pastor Luchibelli, and I said, my prayer is that your light will be brighter than it's ever been before. Because right there in that neighborhood where the church is located, right there is where God needs to shine his light. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen? I contacted the national overseer in France and, and talked to him a little bit about what was going on and, and, and tried to encourage him and let him know that people all over the world are praying for you because they're wanting to start a new seminary right there in Paris, a new Bible seminary that they can have a greater influence in the lives of the people that are there. And yet we see the destruction and the things that are going on. We didn't realize when we were there that we were right in the middle of a neighborhood where two weeks later people would leave that and these terrorists would go out and they would cause destruction and take the lives of many people. And, and so when I watched this and I recognized and I realized the places that they're at, I see the military as they're going through the square, which was right outside of the hotel where we stayed. And now it's covered with military there. And I'm thinking, God, it's such an amazing thing that you allowed me to go there and to be a part of that. And you know what I preached when I was there? Building faith in your local church. That's the message that, that they gave me to preach at this conference that I was there. And, and I pray that that was something that encouraged the lives of the people. Because right now, Brussels is closed up. You can't get in and you can't get out. The alert category is so high that they completely close the borders. Nobody can go in or out. And it's an amazing thing that in the midst of all of that, I want you to know that God is moving. God is moving in the lives of people. And you know what they're thinking? They're thinking, how can we affect people's lives? How can we disciple people? How can we share Jesus? They're not concerned about the terrorists. They're concerned about Jesus. And they're concerned about uh, people who are lost. And I think that that's how we all need to be. And I'm very grateful that the Lord allowed me to be a part of what's going on right there. All too often, our minds only reflect in a, in a, in, in a sense of thanksgiving when it's triggered by events that we see on TV or we, events that we see. And, and, and we're thankful that it doesn't directly affect us. Sometimes that's how we're thinking. Sometimes we're challenged and we have a tendency to reflect on the goodness of God uh, around the holiday season. We, we become very nostalgic. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I just become very nostalgic. And I start to reflect back and think about what God has done and how good God has been to us over the years. The scripture constantly reminds us that gratitude and thanksgiving is not just when terrible things happen to others and not to us. Thanksgiving, it, we, are, we are instructed that Thanksgiving is not just uh, when good things directly happen to us, or even just because it's a holiday or we become nostalgic and find ourselves reflecting on our lives. No, the scripture is a constant, consistent reminder of what we have and we should be thankful for. Amen? 
The Bible tells us in Psalms 107, verse 1, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. First uh, Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing songs to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Glory to his holy name, let the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works, which he had done, his wonders and his judgments and the judgments of his mouth. The theme that we, the, we, the constant thing that we see is that he is good. Amen. Do you know that God is good? Amen. Listen, there's a lot of people today that are saying God is not good because of what's going on. Innocent people are dying, and that's not a just God. But he is a just God. He's a loving God. He desires that no man should be lost. Amen. Amen. But it is appointed unto man once to die. Amen. Amen. We don't know when the appointment is, but I promise you it's an appointment you won't be late for. It's not an appointment you can reschedule. Amen? Amen. When God says it's over, it's over. Amen. And like I told my, my auntie, that they gave her like a week. Okay? That was several months ago. And they told her, you know, you need to call your family in. You need to take care of all your business because we can't do this. You're, you're just not going to survive. If you don't take dialysis every single day, you'll die. But if you take dialysis every single day, you'll die. So there's nothing that we can do for you. Several months later now, guess what? She's still around. Amen. And I told her, listen, the, the doctors can say one thing, but we'll believe the report of God. Amen? That's what I told my mom sitting in the hospital. Everybody kept asking my mom, how come you're not, how come you're not upset? How come you're not troubled? How come you're, how, why are you taking this so, so, so easy? Uh, and she said, I had cancer once before, and I'm still here. And she said, it's because so many people are praying for me. My feeling to my mom is, just can repent. Go ahead and repent. Ask the Lord to come into your heart. Let's, let's make this thing official, okay? Because she talks, she understands this, and she understands that it's only by the grace of God that she is here today. Amen. 26 years later, breast cancer has come back. 26 years later. And it came back on the side that she had had a vasectomy. You know, and the doctors are going, we don't understand this. We don't understand how that could possibly be the case. But 26 years ago, they weren't doing the radiation, they weren't doing the keep, they weren't doing all the things that they're doing today. And so he said that my guess is, is that you've always had it, it just didn't, you know, become aware that it was still alive until just recently. But I'm very grateful that if this is what it takes for mom to come to know Christ, amen? If this is what it takes for mom to come to know Christ, I would much rather, I'd much rather her go through this difficulty and find Jesus for eternity awaits at some point. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then judgment. I want her to be in heaven. I want to see her in heaven. Amen. The theme that we read throughout the scripture is that God is good, that we need to give thanks, and that his mercy endures forever. It is actually, this theme is actually found 35 times in the Old Testament. The 136th Psalm along, uh, along, alone is a chapter that speaks of this expressly. The first three verses of that chapter uh, encapsulates the essence of the entire 26 verses. Let me just read to you the first three verses of Psalms 136. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Verse 2, I thought was very interesting. Oh, give thanks to God, the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Verse 3, Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his mercy endures forever. David had a way to put things, it appears. Let me read those again. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. Do you kind of get the theme there? Amen? That we are to give thanks to God. Why? Because his mercy endures forever. 
I believe one of the main reasons David was found to be the apple of the Lord's eye was that he gave thanks unto the Lord. Not only was he a man of repentance, but he also was a man that was very thankful. If we return to our opening text verses in Acts chapter 17, we're reminded of the story of the ten lepers. Nine went their way, but only one came back to give thanks for the miracle of life. I expressed to you uh, last Sunday morning that I find it interesting that I believe that one of the greatest threats in our Christian society today is indifference. We know that, um, that this has already infected our society, and we've watched it become an epidemic. I showed you a video last week that I showed you before. That, that I, as I told you, it's very difficult for me even to watch the video without, without crying because you have a little boy on the streets of New York, it's 15 degrees out, and he's out there, no shoes, wearing a t-shirt that's torn, pants that are torn, and he wraps up in a garbage bag and is laying on the sidewalk in New York City, and for two hours, people walk past him and do nothing. Nothing. And the man who goes to him, takes his own coat off and puts it on him, was another homeless guy. Our world is infected with a spirit of indifference. We don't want to get involved. If I get involved, it may require something of me. Right? You can go online and you can watch this epidemic and they, they, they do stuff like this all the time. They set people up. They, they, they do these things. And, and they want to see how people are going to respond. Anybody seen any of those kind of things? <clears throat> and yet what we find is that people are indifferent. We say, well, that's the world. That's not the church. But is it? I think the church oftentimes responds and reflects the same way. Sometimes even in the church. Sometimes, the truth is, in the church, oftentimes indifference is more rampant in the church than outside the church. Mm. Indifference. We know that it's already infected our society and we watch it become an epidemic. But I think it's becoming more and more of a problem, especially among prominent established denominations. In other words, we seem to see more indifference among people who have been raised in the church or around the church more than those who uh, have not come from a church background. It seems that those that have had the opportunity to be raised in the church take so much of this for granted. But you get somebody that was not raised from church, and were not raised in a church atmosphere, they were raised perhaps in a, in, in a family that didn't believe in God, they got involved with a lot of junk out there, all the things that the world had to offer. They had a very difficult life, and somewhere along the line, they found Christ. And they will do anything. Their life is filled with so much gratitude for what God has given them that they'll do anything that you ask them to do. And most of the times, they'll do it and you don't have to ask. It's just something they want to be a part of. Amen. Why? Because their lives are filled with so much gratitude. Why is, why is it that often is the case that those who have been raised in church take this for granted? They take life for granted. They take the blessings of God for granted. Why is it that the church people are the ones that you have to beg and plead to come to church? Huh? Why is it that the church people are the ones that you have to constantly remind them and teach them year after year after year what tithing and giving is? Oh, honey, we, we shifted from a soft message back over to the hard message again. Why is it that, that the church people are the ones that you have to bribe with potlucks to bring somebody to the house of God? But win somebody out of the street, win someone out of the street that has had nothing, and they will bring every human being they can get their hands on, they'll bring it into the house of God. How do I know this? Because I've had those people. I've had those members. My buddy Lionel, some of you have met him, he pastors down in Tumwater, the church God across. He pastors a small church down there. You guys have spoken to him. Good God. He was a guy that was raised in the streets. When he was 12 years old, he got jumped by a gang 
over in the Tri-Cities. And so he went home and told his crackhead dad. And his dad went to the closet, pulled down a 38 pistol, handed him the pistol, 12 years old, handed him the pistol, and said, go take care of your business. So he did. He got on his bicycle. He rode his bicycle down to the park and opened fire in the whole crowd. He said, it's only by the grace of God. He said, because I was a good shot, even at 12 years old. He said, my father trained me. He said, but it was only the grace of God that I didn't hit a single person in the crowd. Only by the grace of God. Why? Because God had other intentions and he knew that would have been a wasted life. Tell me God doesn't, is in control even over the sinner's life. Amen? Did he go through hard times? Yeah, he went through horrible times. Run a crack house, run a drug house that in Colorado that, that when they busted, and when they busted the house, it went all over the radios. Lionel's fun house has finally come down. And he said it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Because when they put him in jail, an assembly of God preacher came in there and shared with him Jesus Christ. And it changed his life. He said it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me that I got busted. Why? Because he was on a fast track to nowhere. And he had wound up in hell. He's got a lot to be grateful for. I can tell you when we pastored together in Utah and he was my associate pastor, he would bring people to church. And I'm telling you, Jim, some of the people he would bring into church, man, it was like, oh, great day in the world. So, um, everybody check your wallets, check your, check your purses, make sure you keep all your stuff up. I mean, that's what, I mean, the people that he was bringing in were rough people. He was bringing them straight up out of the street. Some of them he was bringing in, they were out of their mind. They were crazy. They had had meltdowns over the years. They had had drug overdoses. They, had, they were in alcoholism. They were, they were sinners. And they brought them to the house of God. And they found Jesus Christ. They found a place where people would say, you know, it's all right. We love you. And we're going to continue to love you. One of the young men that he brought in was a drug burnout. He was such a drug burnout that he couldn't carry on a regular conversation with you. He just did this a lot. He talked to me. He, goes, he, was a, he was a burnout, total burnout. And we continued to pray for him and pour into him and pour He's pastoring a church today in Utah. But you'd have never known it when he came walking in that first day. All messed up on drugs. Life all messed up. And this is what Lionel was bringing to the house of God. Why? Because he related with those people because that's where he'd come from. I never had to ask Lionel to bring somebody to church. I never had, never had to do a promotion to get him to be aware that we need to bring people to the house of God because this is where they can find help. Amen? I'm talking about indifference. I'm talking about being thankful. I would think that we as children of God would long to bring people to the house of God, especially those of us that have been blessed enough to be around us for any length of time. We know this is the place that can change people's lives. Amen? Yeah. And if we know that, why wouldn't we want to share that? Why wouldn't we want to come back and, and, be, and show our gratitude to the Lord by bringing him more people? In our story, one of the ten returned to offer thanks for what Jesus had done for him. Notice in verse 16 of that 17th chapter of Acts that he was not a Jew. In other words, he was not a religious person, a churchgoer but a Samaritan. One who had been despised by the aforementioned church crowd, and yet he is filled with gratitude. As I stated last week, love will find a way. Indifference will find an excuse. Love will find a way. Indifference will find an excuse. Charles Brown once wrote, why did only one cleansed leper return to thank Jesus? The following are nine suggest suggested reasons why, why the nine did not return. One waited to see if the cure was real. One waited to see if it would last. One said he would see Jesus later. One decided that he had never had leprosy to begin with. One said 
he would have gotten well eventually. One gave the glory to the priests. One said, oh well, Jesus didn't really do anything anyway. One said, any rabbi could have done it. And one said, I was already much improved. Isn't that the mindset of so many people today when we invite them? Isn't it the mindset of so many, many people once God has intervened in their life that how quickly they forget that it was God who did it? Amen? You ever met someone like that? Have you ever been that person? God intervenes. We, uh, we're, we're facing a difficulty in life and we call upon the elders of the church to pray for us. And the church prays for us and God intervenes. But how quickly we forget what God has done. How quickly we get caught back up in life again. Amen. What's the difference between one who is faithful and one who lives by faith? The faithful person wants a pat on the back for showing up. The person who lives by faith wouldn't have it any other way but to show up. Because they're filled with gratitude for what God has done. Amen. A person that lives by faith, it's a lifestyle. It's not just an event. It's a lifestyle. They, they have become what they believe. Amen? But too many today just simply want to be identified as faithful. They want to be identified as those who show up. They do just enough to show up. They do just enough to be identified as a churchgoer. They do just enough to be identified as a Christian. I got in a long conversation a couple days ago with a, a lady that said, that, that was talking about Christianity. And she was talking about all of the stuff that she's involved in. And her parents were involved in it. And, and they were good people and they did lots of things on a world scale. And then she said, what separates you and your Christianity from mine? And I said, mine's a lifestyle. I don't need somebody to tell me I'm a Christian. I don't need somebody to identify me as a Christian. I live a life of faith. And because I live that life of faith, my life reflects Christ. It don't reflect the things I do. Amen. I don't have to be identified as a Christian because I go to church. My lifestyle reflects it. In other words, I don't do the things that everybody else is doing Monday through Saturday and then show up on Sunday and that makes me a Christian. No, my lifestyle has changed. There's a lot of things I don't do that I used to do. The reason is, is because of the way I believe. I believe in Christ. I don't want to offend Him. Amen? That's the difference. That a lifestyle, a belief system, my belief in Christ, and my belief in following Him causes me to live a way that is pleasing to Him. And I'm not concerned about what others are thinking, I'm more concerned about what He is thinking. William Law, in his book, Serious Call to, uh, to a Devout and Holy Life, writes, Would you know who is the greatest saint in the world? It is not he who prays most or fasts most. It is not he who gives most in, in, in offerings or most uh, imminent for uh, temperance, chastity, or justice. But it is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything that God wills, who received everything as an instance of God's goodness and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, the Bible says, By him then let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Sometimes we don't have it to give monetarily. Sometimes we don't have the gifts that other people have. But nevertheless, we should all be thankful. The praise, the, the thanksgiving that we give the Lord should be something that easily rolls off our tongue because of our heart is so filled with the gratitude for what he has done for us. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything give thanks 
For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also are called into one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And everything, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. For some today, it's a struggle to find that spirit of thanksgiving. It's not that you're unthankful. But because of distractions, because of events and circumstances, it's easy to lose sight of the reason why we're thankful. Let me share this story in the Bible that might help you rediscover your motive this morning. In the first ten verses of Acts chapter 5, we find the story of Ananias and his wife Sapphira. Most of you are familiar with who these two people are, correct? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. I think most of us. Ananias and Sapphira were, were two people that the Apostle Peter had to deal with. We know that in this story, they had sold a piece of land, and then they lied to the Apostle about how much they sold the land for. They said they sold it for X amount of dollars, or, or whatever their currency was, they sold it for X amount, but they kept a portion of that to themselves. And the thing of it was, is they had, they had created a plan, they concocted a plan, because it was first Ananias that went forward, and, and he lied to Peter about how much he had sold the land for. And Peter told him that God was displeased with, it, with the fact that he lied, that you didn't just lie to me, but you lied to the Holy Ghost. And because of that, God struck him dead, and they carried his body out. Now, a few minutes later, his wife, um, Sapphira, come in. And because they had concocted this plan, she came in and she gave the same story that her husband had given. And God struck her dead. We know that story. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Because of this great, because of this event, great fear fell upon the people, and great signs and wonders were done in the name of Jesus. Many healings and deliverances were accomplished by the power of the Holy Ghost. And this, of course, brought great disapproval from the high priest and the religious people. Isn't it amazing that God will start to move and it's the religious people that become the most critical? You know that? Let a revival break out in this local church. Let people start being healed around here. Let supernatural things start to take place in this local church and watch the Christian or watch the religious circles start to criticize what has taken place. Oftentimes, the reason that they criticize is because it's not happening there. Amen. We're quick often to judge somebody's experience because we're not experiencing what they're experiencing. That's the orphan coming out of us, isn't it? That's the orphan that's crying out, you know, how come they're being blessed and I'm not? Right? I'm doing all what I'm supposed to do. I show up to church every week. I do this, I do that. But isn't that what the Pharisee said when he was in the courtyard? I fast, I pray, I give. But thank God I ain't like him. Right? Of course, the heathen is over there. He... He's so overwhelmed with gratitude that Ray, he won't even look up to heaven. He is so humble that he won't even look up. He don't feel he's even worthy. And the Bible says that he smites his chest and he says, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus asked, which one is more justified? The one who does all the religious stuff or the one who has a grateful and a humble heart? You see, we live in a society today that is all about competition. It's all about, in fact, even among preachers, you go to a, you go to a conference, you go to a camp meeting, and, and, and you can go to these camp meetings, and, and we, for the most part, all the preachers, all the pastors, all we get to see each other once or twice a year as a, as a group. And we go to this, and usually the very first thing that comes out of their mouth is, what's your attendance and how much, you know, how's your time? That's the first two things they want to know. And, and the reason is that they're not concerned about what's happening in your life. 
They're not really concerned about what's happening in your church. It's a competition, and they're, it's a measuring stick. They're measuring their church, their events, based on what your church is doing or not doing. I'm better than that church, or I'm not as good as that church. But I'm here to tell you, folks, whether you have five people sitting in a congregation or 5,000 people sitting in the congregation, a pastor for us, we have to remain thankful for what God allows us to do. Because it's not in the amount of people that sit in there. Listen, I don't know a single preacher that don't want to preach to a crowd. No, but everybody wants a crowd. Why? Because our, our thought pattern is the more that we can impact, the more impact for the kingdom of God we'll have in a lost world. That's the mindset. It's not about, for the most part, it's not about somebody patting us on the back and say, oh, we preached it, um, you know, in the midst of 5,000 people. That has nothing to do with it at all. Well, what my, I'll, well, I'll just speak on my behalf. When my thinking, I want, the reason I want a crowd is because it's going to give us more influence and impact out there. Not in here, out there. If we only have five people, that, that only those five people, they're only going to reach a percentage of people, correct? But if we have 500 people, there's a larger group that we can reach. Wouldn't you agree? And isn't that what this is all about? Remember, when you got saved, it stopped being about you. It started being about a lost world. Amen? But so much of our time is built on looking inwardly instead of looking out. And I'm here to tell you that this is not what the scripture instructs us to do. This is why the parable is in here, or the story is in here, about the ten lepers. Nine lepers were self-absorbed and self-consumed. Only one came back to show gratitude for what God had done in his life. If you go on in that fifth chapter of Acts, you'll find out that after these healings and these deliverances and these things were taking place, the religious group, the Sanhedrin, became very irritated over this. Verse 18 of Acts chapter 5 tells us that they laid hands on the apostle and the other disciples and threw them into prison. Why? Because of what had transpired. But the angel of the Lord came and opened up the cell doors and set them free and then gave this, them this instruction. Go, stand, and speak all of the words of life to the people where? In the temple. In the temple. He didn't say, I'm going to set you free. Now go run and hide. But he instructed them, now I want you to go right down in the midst of it. Go right down to where the Sanhedrin is at. Go right where the high priest is at. Stand right on the front porch and tell them about Christ. That's what the angel told them to do. And the Bible says that they immediately did it. They went down, so they went straightway into the temple and taught. Of course the word spread, and once again the high priest and the council investigate who was now preaching in Jesus' name. They checked the prison only to discover that the men that they had locked up were now gone. And finding them now in the temple preaching and teaching, once again they lay hold on them, and they bring them to the prison, and they, this time they bring them before the Sanhedrin council. Acts chapter 5, verse 27. And bringing them, they stood in the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Boy, wouldn't that be an awesome uh, accusation? You're preaching Jesus and it's having an effect. Amen? I love what Peter says. Verse 29. And Peter and the apostles answered and said, It's better for us to obey God than men. Pretty straightforward, huh? Oh, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now the argument ensues. Should they kill these men? Or should they set them free? Acts chapter 5 verse 39. But if it is God, you cannot overthrow. This was one of the Sanhedrin. Steps up and says, listen, we're messing with the wrong group of guys here. If you kill them, then the people are going to turn on us. Okay? God will speak through good leaders 
God will speak through bad leaders. But, but do not be confused. God does speak to his people. Amen? Here, we, he's using one of the Sanhedrin. And they, then he rises up to the rest of them and says, Lest perhaps you found enough to fight against God. Are you actually, he's asking, are you actually going to fight God? Verse 40, and they obeyed him. And calling the apostles, they just didn't give them a slap on the wrist. The Bible says they beat them. They commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then indeed they departed from the presence of the Sanhedrin, doing what? This kills me. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be shamed for his name. Rejoicing that they just got a stew beat out of them. Because God chose them and found them worthy to endure this type of suffering. And this is what they did in verse 42. And every day, every day, where? In the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Beat is fine. Mock us, that's all right. In prison is, do what you need to do. But we're not going to stop. It's better to obey God than men. Acts chapter 6, verse 1a. And in those days, the disciples having multiplied. Because they continued every day. Everyone say every day. Because they did this every day. The Bible says the disciples multiplied. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. For this cause I also suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. A church that is truly thankful, no matter the situation, will be a growing church. If you will show your thankfulness publicly, people will long for what you have. Amen. As there seems to be little to be thankful for out there in the world. You don't think that people are looking for something to gravitate to? Something positive? They're looking for answers. To be truly grateful for all things is really to know and to understand the mind of Christ. If we really know Him, we will also know that without Him, we can do nothing. As I conclude the message this morning, let me read an excerpt from a speech President Abraham Lincoln made on April 30th, 1863. The event... Now, how about this for an event? The event is the proclamation of a national day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. What a holiday. Amen? He voiced these words. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved the many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to God uh, that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. How I recognize this morning the same longing by many today. To see not only our nation, but our churches repent and become thankful again for all the many blessings that have been afforded you and I. As we embark on this holiday season, let us consider one another, love one another, and be thankful for all that God has given us. Let this, be, let, let this not be provoked by a holiday celebration, but rather by the Holy Ghost who longs to lead us into all truth. See, Holiday seasons, the reason I don't, I'll be a little transparent with you this morning. The reason I don't enjoy preaching holiday sermons 
is because I think that they can be very generic. It, it, it's, not, it's not the Word of God that challenges us. It, and oftentimes, holiday messages are created to pull on the heartstrings, and the holiday messages are created to make you feel warm and fuzzy. But if that's all that we provided, and that's all that I provide for you as a pastor, how is that going to help you in your day-to-day -day life? If I tell you you need to be thankful because it's Thanksgiving, and that's all I can relate to you, and there are many churches today that that's exactly what they're hearing. Or should I challenge you with the Word of God and say, listen, it is, our, it is the will of God for your life to be thankful. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. Brethren, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have you in here concerning what the will of the Lord is for you. And the third thing that he instructs them is to give thanks always. This is the will of God for your life. It's what the scripture tells us. First Thessalonians tells us that this is the will of God for your life. To be thankful. Thankful for what? Thankful for it all. Believe it or not, Sister Gail, you need to be thankful for the cancer that you're having to deal with. I mean, that, that's a hard thing to say because we don't understand that. But had it not been for cancer, maybe you wouldn't be here today. If it had not have been for that funeral, you would definitely not be here today, not in this church. But because of the association that I had with Liz over there, you and I crossed paths. Because I was there to help at the funeral, I met this wonderful lady. And though the doctors gave her an evil report, we've been praying and trusting God on her behalf, and so has she. And because of that, she's still here. Regardless of what the doctors have to say. Amen. When Jack came in and told us that the doctors said that he had full-blown cancer and he had six months, three months to live, he come walking in through that bottom door down there. Some of you remember Jack. He came in here and Terry immediately, under the, under the unction of the Holy Ghost, said, we won't believe that report. Whose report will you believe? And we, at that moment, stopped what we were doing, laid hands on Jack, and we began to pray for him. What we found out and what he found out, and you say whether this is God or not, the doctor that was dealing with his cancer, and they, were, they started running heavy treatments on him. He, in a process of conversation with a doctor friend of his in Phoenix, Arizona, was sharing with him through the conversation about Jack. That doctor was a cancer specialist, and he said, stop the treatments immediately. Stop them. He said, I'm getting on an airplane and I'm flying there. On, out of his own expense, he flew here. They called Jack, told Jack to go to the university. He goes down to the university. That doctor from Phoenix takes a look and says, we've misdiagnosed you, we've been treating you, we're actually killing you, we're not helping you. They changed the treatments, and Jack's fine. Now, what did that come from? Did it come from because the doctor was more, was more concerned with Jack than he was any other patient? Maybe. But I tend to believe it had to do with Terry and I stopping what we were doing, recognizing the move of the Holy Ghost and the unction of the Spirit at that moment, laying hands on him, and the Bible says that the prayer of faith will heal the sick. It's not anything we did. It's what God said, are you willing to be the vessel? And Terry responded in obedience. I'm here to tell you something today, folks. It doesn't matter the circumstances that you're in. It don't matter the situations that you're facing today. If you'll be thankful, if you'll recognize that it is God's hand moving in your life, then everything will work out. You may die to die is to gain. You may be poor and destitute living on the street. Well, that's not a very good thing to be. But if you have Christ, 
you have everything. Amen. Amen. Remember the man who sat outside the rich man's house. When he died, the angels escorted him to heaven. But when the rich man died, even with all the pomp and circumstances, when he opened his eyes, he was in hell. I'm here to tell you this morning, we have a lot to be thankful for. Don't you agree? I want you to stand to your feet. I hope this has not been a heavy message. I really wasn't trying for it to be. I just want you to be encouraged today. Be thankful. Be thankful. Because God has done so much for you. He, do you realize we still, as of today, we still have the freedom to come in here and to worship the Lord. Free. Nobody's here to tell us we can't do that. Amen. And God has given us the right, the privilege, the honor to be able to come in here today where there's heat for some of us, way too much of it. Is this hot?